first public lecture series, Midsummer Night Science. We hope to provide you with a better understanding of the latest advances in genetics and genomics, while also providing you with an opportunity to interact with some of our researchers leading these efforts. Eric Lander inaugurated our series with an exciting overview of the human genome, our DNA. Last week, Diane Wirth described how she uses genetic information to outwit infectious diseases such as malaria. Tonight, you will hear from Fintan Steele, who is the Director of Scientific Communications, excuse me, Scientific Education and Public Communications at the Broad Institute. Fintan will be leading us in what should prove to be a spirited discussion on the um, ethical and social implications of new discoveries of DNA. We hope that you enjoy tonight's lecture and we welcome your feedback. Please feel free to share your thoughts with us on the cards provided. For those who are interested, we will be posting the lectures on the Midsummer Night Science website for you to view. These should be available in the coming weeks. For now, enjoy tonight's discussion, and we hope to see you again next week. Thanks, Michelle. Yay. C can you hear me all right? Let's start there. OK. Great. Um, those that know me know that I tend to be a little uh, spirited and a little outrageous. Um, so brace yourselves. I'm going to set some ground rules before we begin. One of the problems with uh, any talk about ethics, regardless of where in ethics you, you uh, go, tends to elicit a lot of, a lot of heat, but not a lot of, of uh, light. So we're going to change that here tonight, especially given the area we're speaking in. So there's not going to be great answers to all these ethical quandaries tonight. If they haven't figured it out already in Congress, I mean, how could we do it? Um, <clears throat> but I do want you to think. The second part is this is a little PG-13. It's impossible to talk about genetics without talking about reproductive ethics. And so if you are queasy um, or, or easily uh, 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 angered by uh, that kind of discussion, consider yourself warned and there's still food out there in the lobby. <clears throat> Thirdly, there's going to be a whole section of this that's going to be interactive. I have a pile of case studies here that we're going to pass out and I want you all to engage in trying to do the ethical thinking around them. Um, just show respect for other people's opinions. That, that would be the best. And finally, this is not a sermon. As you can see on the thing, I actually uh, used to speak about ethics professionally from a pulpit. Uh, it's a slightly different setting. There, you don't expect people to talk back to you. Here, I kind of welcome it, okay? And I want you to, to ask questions and engage, okay? Um, and I just love that quote by, from Hippocrates who, uh, who kind of set the stage for everything we're going to talk about tonight. So our agenda, what I want to do is just briefly touch on the kind of the big areas that the science is impacting in society and that raises ethical questions and just raise those questions really briefly. We're going to go into more depth when we get into the case studies. Uh, I'm calling it quandaries. Um, then I want to talk about ethical reasoning in its own right. What does it mean to do ethical reasoning? Because until we can get that kind of clear in our heads, we really can't address the issues that are being raised by some of the technology we've got. And beyond ethical principles, I want to get at the foundations. What is the stuff underlying ethics that, that we really have to address before we can get to any kind of consensus, if at all? And finally, don't panic about the homework thing. The homework is simply the case studies we don't get to tonight. But it gives you something to, to do when you go home tonight instead of watching The Simpsons, OK? <clears throat> so let's start with this notion of good science versus bad science. This is the quote when, he, uh, when uh, our president vetoed the bill last Friday. He said, crossing this moral line would needlessly encourage a conflict between science and ethics that can only do damage to both. Regardless of your political persuasion, that's just a silly thing to say. How can you have ethics on one hand and science on the other? It, it doesn't work that way. Both are human endeavors. Both are like wrapped up in this glory that's being human. And, and to think that you can separate them at some level is kind of crazy. But we're going to get to the point tonight where I can help you understand why he believes this, if he believes it. <clears throat> so let's talk about a little bit about what the, the, the uh, ethics, what genetics has brought us to. I'm going to cover these four major areas just really briefly, like I said. Uh, genetically modified food is obviously a hot topic. Molecular forensics, uh, it's, it, it's just entirely 
change the criminal justice world and it's, it's marching ahead. Uh, the notion of diagnostics, um, how do we look at diseases, what do we think about, and uh, how do we, we make prognoses as well as diagnoses. And then therapeutics and how it's changing that whole area and the questions that that raises. So the GM food is, is, uh, is a hot topic, especially in places like Cambridge, but especially overseas. Uh, there's several crops that are genetically modified that are out there, but the corn is the most amazing. It's, there's more than 300 million acres worldwide of genetically modified corn right now, uh, more resistant to pesticide, more yield, et cetera. And it's more than 50% of the US crop currently. So if you've had a corn product lately, uh, the chances, if you've been to Taco Bell, you've done uh, GM corn. Um, <laughs> And it's, re, you know, it's reduced the need for pesticides, it's great. It's increased health in places, for instance, blindness, where vitamin A is built into rice uh, in the developing world, decreased malnutrition across several different crops. So from that perspective, it's generally a good thing. But it certainly does raise questions. People argue about the loss of small farms as a result of the, the, the huge price of doing this kind of business. People argue that it's against nature. Um, we'll get to that kind of argument in a bit. Um, the unknown consequences. What happens if a, if a genetically modified crop takes over the world? Um, I, I mean, kudzu's got a head start and it's not genetically modified, but it's a, it's a concern. And then the extreme politicization around this, this uh, politicization around this issue, in, in, uh, especially in Europe and in Africa, uh, makes it very difficult to get any light out of the discussion. It's, it's largely heat. So those are things we want to talk about. Uh, forensics. I love this example that I've got up there. So um, it, it's the earliest place that's kind of accepted genomic science, uh, genome science. In fact, the legal body of work, if I skip to the last point, actually favors the science largely, which is pretty amazing considering all the other concerns about genetics. There's been a virtual end to paternity trials. There used to be 100,000 per year in the US paternity trials, paternity cases, and now it's virtually zero thanks to uh, a, Almost zero. Um, there's still a few folks that will fight the DNA evidence, <laughs> and it and it and it frees it frees the innocent. That and it, it generally can help you capture the guilty. The, the example I have there, notwithstanding, on the uh, screen, that's the actual trial data from the uh, O.J. Simpson trial. If you can't read it, but there are significant concerns involved with forensic science. Um, every year, more and more states require blood samples from an a, a ever-widening number of crimes. It's moved well beyond felonies into misdemeanors. It's a huge number of, of uh, samples in databases already. And access to these is pretty easy to get to if you have uh, a, a password and a badge. There's a disproportional impact on minorities. Um, there's the nature of the criminal justice system. We're not going to argue the, the ethics of that tonight, but it's a fact the way it's set up. There tends to be, with the, the legal caseload, even a more of an over-reliance on, on DNA evidence. Other evidence is starting to be dismissed. Everybody's going right for the, the blood smear. Um, and then a real lack of public understanding about what DNA evidence shows and doesn't show. Um, and, and this is a, a significant problem across the science, as you can see from the slide I just showed you, the example. <clears throat> the diagnostics, uh, and this is the stuff that we're really invested in here at Broad. So already, prenatal diagnostics is, is pretty well established and is growing. There's like more than 30 disorders in several states that are tested now uh, prenatally. It's, it's resulted in a tenfold increase in what are called positives or, or uh, uh, threatening genetic uh, uh, diseases. It, it's gone from one in 10,000 just 10 years ago, or five years ago, to one in 1,000 positives now. And there's over four million babies tested every year. Premarital screening for major recessive diseases has expanded. It's no longer just the really tough stuff, but it's, it's looking at things that are in that kind of grayer line we're going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> the more data we compile, the more certain we can be about your percentage risk for, for getting a specific disease as a result of the genetic uh, uh, load you carry. And then finally, preventive medicine is starting to really take off. It used to be pretty straightforward if you had the, the gene variant that, that caused you una made you unable to uh, uh, metabolize phenylalanine, you just don't eat it. You know, that was the preventive medicine. But there's more and more things that we're starting to consider that could fall into this, even among the mushier stuff. And that's all 
good stuff in general, but there are real concerns around it. So the technology is such that in five years, we could have a, another tenfold increase in the uh, number of positives found. One in 100 children will be found to have some genetic variant that's considered un undesirable. And we're kind of launching then into this private eugenics area where the parents are basically deciding whether or not to carry a child to term. When you get to one in 100, we're talking like a serious, uh, area, uh, a serious turnover or a serious uh, a load of uh, abortions um, relative to the number of conceptions. The, the issue here is that the current regulatory framework is set up just to allow this to happen without discussion. We'll talk about that a little more. There's also an expansion now, obviously, as we're starting to learn stuff. You want to know if you're going to develop Alzheimer's or Huntington's. It's expanding well beyond premarital screening. It's not enforced anywhere yet, but the options are, are growing. And there have been calls in various places to, to do that. Um, one of the real problems with diagnostics and the most frustrating thing we face in the scientific work we do is that you can tell someone, here are your percentage chances of developing X, and your options are have a nice day. Um, it's, it's a real nightmare for genetic counselors, but also that's not where we want to be. Ultimately, we want to get to the point we can say, here's what we can do about it. But it's a real problem now. And so there's lots of questions about, is it ethical to tell someone when you find out X or Y or Z, um, if it's not something that's immediately life-threatening, but could be a, a real issue later in their life. Also, the uncertainty still about the true risk that's involved in certain genetic combinations. Just there's a lack of data. We're getting closer to being able to be more accurate, but there's still a lot of, of leeway there. Even some of the genes that are considered to be one gene, one disease. There's a, a, disease, a gene that uh, makes the opsin, the little molecule in your back of your eye that can capture light. It, it alters it in such a way that you could develop retinitis pigmentosa. And most people that have that particular variant get that. It's a terrible form of, gene of uh, retinal degeneration. But a lot of people who carry the gene don't get blind. Even though they have the same gene as their sibling, or they have the same genetic thing in one eye that they have in the other, and one eye will go blind and the other won't. We just don't have enough understanding of that and to, to really predict. And then finally, the one I'm <clears throat> going to do another slide on is this whole notion of privacy, which is really the hot point of a lot of this stuff. There's significant pressures on, around this notion of privacy. One of the, I'm not blocking that, am I? One of the most uh, interesting when you think about it is it's kind of an end of equality. That when, when the notion was that any one of us could be nailed by a disease at any given time, that was kind of a comfortable thing. But all of a sudden now, it, may not be necessarily true at the level of genetics, that some people will carry a slightly different genetic uh, uh, load than another, uh, another group of people. And so hidden within this is this possibility of fragmenting society across uh, um, their genetic uh, traits. Second big issue is this notion of access. To, if, if we do get to the point which is driving ahead, and we'll talk about that, to where you can actually enhance one's genetic uh, makeup, access becomes a major issue at, at that point. Um, the whole notion of what is a disease. So it was pretty clear for a while that Tay-Sachs, uh, some of these really horrifying uh, diseases are serious genetic diseases. Then you get into this kind of grayer area of cystic fibrosis. Is that a real disease? It's a disease, but is it a disease that requires early termination of the, uh, of the uh, child carrying it? It's a significant concern. And then you can start thinking of more and more things. Do we get to the point that diabetes is considered a disease that won't be acceptable? Do we get to the point where intelligence becomes an issue? These are not like scary scenarios. They're, they're scary scenarios, but they're not made up uh, uh, a, whole, a whole cloth. They're uh, things we have to think about. Then the whole question of social good versus private good is a major issue in the US. The Constitution is written in such a way that basically your rights are based on what other people can't do to you. So it's a very private-based kind of thing. However, a lot of this genetic stuff is raising issues of social equity and how are we going to make those things work together? And ultimately, as we move forward, is the market going to be just the decider of this if we don't figure out a way in? If you think about in vitro fertilization and the outcry against it um, when it first came out and just a lot of hand-wringing and stuff, and it's become pretty acceptable practice. 
but because the marketplace for it uh, was there. There was a market and it kind of filled its niche. We can see the same thing happening with stem cells and cloning. Uh, see the same thing happening with some genetic therapies. So the question is, is that how we're going to let it decide or are we really going to engage this conversation? <clears throat> okay, and then therapeutics. <clears throat> the actual stuff that'll help us be able to say, have, not say have a nice day, but say here's what we can do. We're right at the tip of an iceberg of what we would call rational drugs or a whole bunch of different names that's been given. Uh, I, I don't know how familiar you are with Gleevec or Aressa. Gleevec is a, a, a drug that's made for a specific type of CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia. It's a result of, uh, of a genetic rearrangement where there's kind of a unique protein that comes from two chromosomes joining in a weird way. Um, and Gleevec, it, and this particular protein results in this form of leukemia. Gleevec is a drug that fits right into that, the yellow thing you see there, right into the pocket of this protein. It's an amazing drug targeted at the molecular cause of, of this uh, disease. Uh, Eressa is another one that, uh, uh, for lung cancer that goes and attacks a specific protein receptor that's mutated in such a way that only about 10% of lung cancer people have it, but it works great for that 10%, but doesn't do a thing for the rest. Uh, um, so we're getting to the point where we're starting to be able to mold drugs to the specific way proteins are misfolded as a result of a mutation in the gene that encodes them. So we're starting to see this open up. Because we have this increased understanding, uh, thanks to the genome work, uh, thanks to advances in protein science, of how molecules work and what happens when they stop working. Um, we're also pushing, you see, uh, genetic gene therapy, uh, genetic therapies coming online. There was a disaster in, in uh, Philadelphia uh, in 1999 where uh, 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 Jesse Gelsinger died from a, not from the gene therapy per se, but from the vector that they were putting the gene in for. There's a lot more kind of gene therapy trials going on right now where they're trying to replace defective genes with good genes. And they're making more and more progress, more and more success. You can actually see a day possibly where you can actually go in and genetically alter the, or change it back to what it should be. And then this whole notion of personalized medicine, as we get more and more understanding of the molecular mechanisms behind diseases, if you think about something like type 2 diabetes, is actually 20 or 30 different diseases at that level of genetics, at that molecular level. So if you're a big pharma company, you've got to be panicked because the blockbuster model is falling apart. You're suddenly dealing with very small patient groups that are all going to have to be treated slightly differently. So it's not a bad thing. It's exciting. That's where we're headed. But it does raise a lot of issues. If you don't have blockbusters, what are the incentives to develop a drug? We look at a company like Genzyme who targets very small, unique diseases, small by, by uh, devastating diseases, but, but small I mean by the size of the patient group. And they make drugs that are very effective, but they're also $250,000 a year. Um, uncertainty about side effects of these drugs. The interesting thing about us humans, we have maybe 20,000 genes that make a couple hundred thousand proteins, and that kind of conservation, that ability to use these genes for multiple things, multiple pathways in different types of tissue, if you've got a drug that attacks the defective uh, protein in one type of tissue, it may have horrific side effects in another tissue. So how do we think about delivery and how do we, how do we figure out how to, to target these things to the right places when you've got that much overlap in the system? Um, overstepping natural bounds is an objection range. We'll talk about that. Medical education is an incredible nightmare when you think about how doctors are trained now. Most doctors are classically trained and our, our textbooks are set up according to organ systems. If you think like a cardiologist or a pulmonologist. But at the level of molecules, they don't care what organ they're in. They're caring about which proteins they're interacting with. So at some point, you're going to have to have doctors who specialize in this particular molecular pathway. Since this pathway, if you have an alteration here, can cause blindness, an alteration at the next step in the pathway can cause colon cancer, alteration in the next step can cause uh, bone fragility. So instead of going to an orthopod and an ophthalmologist and an uh, uh, oncologist, it would be much better to go to the doctor that understood that pathway. So it's really shifting the paradigm of how medicine is going to be done. Again, access issues. And then who the heck's going to pay for all this under our current system? Um, and how are people going to get access? 
And these are all questions that are really on the edge of ethics as distributive justice as much as uh, they are um, uh, marketing. So let's to, uh, to talk about the notion of, to start thinking about the ethical problems behind all this, we really have to engage what it means to talk about ethics. And what, what does it mean to do ethical reasoning? Um, it's not good science versus bad science, as I'll show you. It's, it's good reasoning versus bad reasoning. And what I want to do is try to elicit from us as a group, what is that moment of ethical reasoning? What is the kind of stuff that goes on in my head? And try to separate away from what goes on in my gut. OK, so here's where we get into the PG-13 stuff. Okay? You have to remember, as a former Catholic priest, a lot of our ethics was concerned with sexual stuff. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how ethical reasoning happens by eliciting it from those kind of examples. It's a good time to run if you're not. Uh. So here's a case. They love case studies. I'm sticking this case up here just to evoke kind of an experience first. So you guys can read it. John and Mary are teenage brother and sister. Neither has experienced sex before. And they agree to try it with each other with proper protection. Afterwards, they decide they'll never do it again. And no one ever knows. And Mary and John never mention it again. So the question is, was this wrong? Well, most of you probably have this you kind of response. So some of that's built into us from taboos. But some of it is like, this is so immoral, so wrong. What I want to get at is, why do you feel that way? What is it that clicked or didn't click? Um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands as to who thinks this is wrong or not, because that is just <laughs> reveal, reveal more than we want to know here tonight. But, so as long as we're on to this PG-13 level, let's do a thought experiment. I offer for your, your amazement, these are sins the Catholic Church is very concerned with. Okay? Contraception, masturbation, premarital sex, rape, bestiality, homosexual acts, and incest. If you were to rank those, in the order of which is the least bad and which is the most bad, how would you do it? I'm not going to ask anyone to tell me. <laughs> but you probably have an idea in your mind how you'd kind of rank them. And being the great guy I am, I'm going to show you how I would rank them. Okay, so my order of wrongness, from the least wrong to the most wrong. Okay, so premarital sex, okay, contraception, I mean, you know, it happens. Contraception, masturbation, homosexual acts, bestiality, incest, and rape. So I, I it, they could shift up and down depending on the mood I'm in on any given day. But it's, it, it's generally kind of the order from the least bad to the, 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 the worst. And I've got to get at, why do I think that way? Whoop. So where do ethical principles come from? I'm holding, a, you see a copy there, of the, the cover. I'm holding my book, what's called the Old Handbook of Moral Theology. Um, these aren't, you can't find these anymore, but they're still very much in effect. The priests used to sit in the confessional with these, and these are amazingly detailed about, <laughs> make fascinating reading between confessions. Um, amazingly detailed as to sinfulness, and what, how level of sinfulness is it? Venial, for those that are Catholic, they understand these things. Venial, mortal, how grave is it? There's a few kind of fun things in here. First of all, I should read read this just because uh, we don't want to get into trouble here. Um, so speculative thinking about what is unchaste. It is gravely sinful to conceive such thoughts with an impure intention, to provoke such thoughts out of levity or to entertain them out of negligence when they involuntarily come to our mind is a mortal or venial sin, according to as whether such thoughts by their nature exert a greater or less influence on arousing the passions. So in other words, the fact that we're talking about this and laughing, we're already in trouble. So just consider yourself warned, OK? And here's just some, a little piece I love just for the sake of the, uh, of the women in the audience. The rights and duties of the wife. The wife has a right to support in keeping with her social standing. <laughs> but it doesn't even begin to define that. So it's, it's, a very, it's a useful book. So whence ethical principles? If I take the ethical principles here and go back to my example, let me give you the order of gravity that comes out. So this is from the least bad to the worst. <laughs> now, the reason bestiality is, is starred is it has something to do with whether it's a male or a female beast and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> now, let's compare this to my, I, I, I'm the devil. There's the angel on the side. So uh, 
when I compare it to mine, we started out okay, but boy, it fell apart quick. Where on earth did I go wrong in thinking about my order here? Why am I so far, I mean, it's obvious why I'm not a priest anymore too, but why am I, why am I so far off the, the path? And it goes down to how the principles that are applied to, to try to get to this understanding. So gravity is defined as the deviation from the ethical principle. When it's the worst, it's the furthest away. And the principle underlying Roman Catholic moral theology is that the proper end of sex is procreation. So if you go back and look at the uh, thing there, that order makes pretty good sense. So I mean, masturbation, you have no chance at procreation at all. Homosexual acts, you know, if, if, barring a, a weird miracle, probably not, but it's, at least there's another thing involved. Bestiality, again, that kind of depends on where you fall in the male-female combinations. Contraception, there's a chance that things may not work. Incest rape, a pretty good chance of, 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 of uh, procreation. And premarital sex is a given. Okay. <laughs> so if you buy that principle, the order makes sense. But it's not good versus bad actions per se. It's the issue is whether or not a specific action, and believe me, I'll bring this back to science. I'm just having some fun. Is, is, is ethically acceptable is not really the action itself, but whether it's in line with whatever the moral principle is that defines that whole group of actions. This becomes a bit of an issue when you start setting out moral principles around things as complicated as genetics. The fact is that these principles don't exist. There's not some crazed cardinal in the, well, there are a few, but there's not some crazed cardinal in the Vatican writing down principles de novo. It's based on a deeper understanding, and that's what we want to get at before we talk about ethics of genetics. So if you think about the objections on our genetics quick run through of GM foods and all that stuff, the main objections can help us understand what is it that underlies these principles. There's uncertainty about effects, the potential misuse of the technology, and this notion of kind of playing God or being outside of our realm. So what the, what the when you interpret these, you think about, well, it's, it's thinking about limitations on human knowledge. There's limitations to human goodness, and there's limitations to human ability. So when you put that together and try to think, okay, what's the foundation behind the principles they're arguing that, against this? The objections are human ignorance, human evil, if you will, or human hubris, human pride. And the common principle is kind of this notion of what they think about human beings in general, or human nature. Ah, so human nature may be what informs ethical principles. We're not there yet, but so human nature, by natural law, sex equals procreation, thus you get that order. So if you have this particular understanding of human nature, at least as sexual beast, and this is what sex is for, then all this kind of makes sense. So how do you define human nature? It's not an easy thing to do, obviously. Um, most do so from this notion of, of the philosophical notion of intent. What is it that humans are for? I want to give you an example of two uh, Christian theologians, simply because that's an area I'm more familiar with. I can do this with uh, Jewish theologians as well. My Muslim theologians, I, I'm a little out of my, uh, my league. Karl Rahner on the left is a Roman Catholic theologian who died recently. Uh, he doesn't look like a very friendly guy. He's actually a really nice guy. Um, and uh, uh, Paul Ramsey on the right died about 20 years ago. He's a Protestant theologian who looks like a nice guy and isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's not because I agree or disagree with either with one or the other, as you'll see. So if we think about the ethics of genetic manipulation, Karl Rahner holds that human nature, as, as a human, you're basically good, but flawed as a result of the fall in Eden. Um, and that's the fact that you're good means your reason hasn't been messed up. So, yeah, it's okay to think about doing good genetic manipulation. It would be all right to do um, within what he defines as good. Where Ramsey comes in from the notion that human nature is basically screwed, that uh, the fall was so horrific, even though we're saved, it's just humans are a disaster and they can't get their heads and their hearts and their guts together. Um, plus, that just tells us then the biology is purely God's domain. It's entirely wrong for us to muck around with it. Two Christian theologians that come to entirely different uh, understandings of, of the ability of humans to intercede with genetics. So they differ in their belief of the relative goodness of human nature. 
obviously that creates issues for their ethical reasoning. But they do agree that the human nature is defined in terms of God. We're going to get down to the next level here in a second. And they agree that human nature is immutable. It doesn't change. This is the way it's been set up. It's just one of them believes it's good and one of them believes it's not so good. So how do you get to, yeah, I love that too. Wouldn't it be easy? It would make it a lot easier to do it this way, wouldn't it? How do you get to the notion of what human nature is? How do you define human nature? Where does it come from? Is it revelation? Is it, it observation of humans? Is it how an individual defines it? Is it how a society defines it? These are questions that seem esoteric, but as I'm trying to show you, they bear directly on whatever ethical outcome you want to reach. So where we're sitting now, any traditional understanding of human nature is under attack by just our advances in biology. You know, it, uh, it's, it, especially those that are based in natural law. The traditional foundations of most ethics are really shaking as a result of this. And there's this great discomfort around all these issues, largely because we just have no way of thinking about them ethically without resorting to our tr traditional understandings of who we are as human beings. And uh, it's, the outcry is a result largely of that insecurity, I think, more than anything else. And it may turn out that human nature is as variable as humans are. Um, at least how we choose to define it. But human nature is not even the last stop. So most people tend now at this point to, to retreat to metaphysics. If we can ground human nature in the divine, then you know, we have something to hang on to. The problem is what that does is move the debate entirely outside of science. And it sets up this dichotomy that we talked about at the beginning with George Bush saying ethics versus science. Is that a true dichotomy? Depends on what one wants to believe about Ontology, basically, in metaphysics. I, I, if, if no God, why be good? That's what a lot of people are afraid of, but we can address those kind of things. I love the Emmanuel, uh, Kant, who was like one of the greatest uh, philosophers, had a terrible time with metaphysics, as you can see. It's a dark ocean. <laughs> Without shores or lighthouse, strewn with many a philosophic wreck. We may be headed there right now ourselves, but it's uh, in this room. So this is kind of where things start to end up. But you have to get down to that level of what are my fundamental beliefs before I can even think about what do I think about human nature, before I can even begin to think about what are the ethical principles that apply and how do they apply to these specific cases. So that's what we want to play with. A couple thoughts before we go into case studies. Um, first of all, science takes place in a culture and society. Science is not a sterile, totally uh, objective thing. It's done by humans, for humans, with humans. So that's colored through with all of this stuff as well. You can't separate science and ethics. True ethical discourse, as I've just mentioned, really requires you to think about what are my deep beliefs? What are the things that are kind of driving these other layers of decision making? And, and challenging them, not just accepting them because I was given them from a, a Moses or anything, but what, be brutally self-honest. What are these beliefs and, and are they right? And then the question is, can science actually enlighten ethical decision-making throughout the whole thing. It's transforming more than medicine, ultimately. As you can see, uh, the interest simply in the question of uh, ethics and science, science is changing society as we know it at, at kind of all levels, and obviously needs to be a partner at this, in this discussion. Okay, so let's play ethicist. I could read you more from the Moral Theology Manual. If you prefer, <laughs> <laughs> these things are rare to come by. <clears throat> can we pass these out, Michelle? So what I've done is put five case studies together that I've jokingly named by that. Oh, you got it? There you go. Hey. I haven't freaked out your kid, have I? No. <laughs> oh, there you go. Let me have one. Because I don't remember them all. Okay. All right. I'll start reading the first one here. And you go, this, is, this is audience participation. First one's pretty straightforward, but it elicits a lot of interesting responses, and it's a very US-based one. So let's say a member of a, a religious group announces that they're working toward building a purer society by mass-producing embryos cloned from their group members. Let's forget about genetic bottlenecks and all that. That's a, a real problem. So they've, they've got a state-of-the-art laboratory to do it in, 
and they've already begun the process. In addition, they're picking a few genetic enhancements that are now available. This is the year 2020, uh, the year 2010, uh, 2007, what in the heck. Uh, though they'll not tell anyone which ones they're doing. Some congressional leaders express outrage, demand that the government take action against this. But the ACLU points out that uh, US traditions respecting freedom of religion and freedom of reproduction require that they just be allowed to do this. So the question is, apart from the evolutionary issues, is this acceptable? Why or why not? Who thinks it's, oh, come on. Someone's got to be able to talk. I've got a microphone here. <laughs> no, they call it the commune. Oh. Uh. Comment on this one. Oh, come on. You guys are all in favor of this? <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's, who's defining pure? Yeah, so they, the commune is saying they're setting up a pure commune. They're going to make converts from, from the cells up. So, yeah, Ted, can you shout? Sure. Uh, I don't see that it's really very different from what people who have set up little insular communities have done for a very long time. I mean, there's some new technology involved, and there's kind of an, an ew factor, I guess, or a scary sort of feel about it. But thinking about it fundamentally, I mean, people have segregated themselves into small little breeding groups for you know, thousands of years. It's a weird, we're an organism that seems to like to form little bands. I, I don't see that it's that different from what people have always done. Yeah. I think one difference between... Did you, uh, you show I'm sorry. Sorry, oh, one, perhaps one difference between the scenario that's existed for thousands of years and the one that's being described now um, is that this is going to be a homogenous community. And of course, community, communities have segregated themselves for tens of thousands of years. But even between separate communities, I think many of us kind of expect that there will be at least some low level of interaction and between communities. And therefore, at some point, you're going to come into contact with this community under what circumstances, who can predict, no one can predict. And instead of finding a community that is diverse, as every community in the world is today, you'll find one which is homogenous, at least at the genetic level. And therefore, at least on that basis, one could perhaps differentiate between the two scenarios and raise an objection, potentially, if you were opposed to a homogenous society. So if I was to think about what is the ethical principle that allows this to happen, is it as simple as what the ACLU argued, uh, maybe, that reproductive freedom and uh, freedom of religion are rights to allow them to do whatever they want? Yeah, so if we were to, if we were to think about the difference between cloning versus like if they get to so so we're actually then getting into this thornier issue of is cloning an individual who's genetically identical to whichever leader they chose there? Is is that a, of a, a degree? Is that a difference in kind, not just degree, from a one that's half a leader, half whatever leader mother they they chose? And that's that's a one of these questions that goes down to that next level. Then, well, what does it mean? What is human nature? Is it simply that you have genetics from two different places? or that your genetic uh, uh, program is from one. Um, at a scientific level, it looks pretty much the same. It's probably not as healthy, but <laughs> so. Great. It seems like it has a scientific component. Much more question about the ethics of, of, of the state. When is, when is it ethical for the state to intercede and override the will of an individual or a group or a community of whatever size you want, rather than a question of, is this a good idea for the economy to do? Because you know it's more structured as, should the government take action or not, rather than, should the economy do this or not? So the kind of underlying thing is, beyond the, below the principle, is even this society versus Why 
there. Uh, presumably, give them to a rival cult or destroy them. <laughs> no, they're, they're probably, I mean, what do we do with I, IVF rejects at this point? So, they tell I think I want to change my mind a little bit. Okay. <laughs> How about the, the bedrock principle of reproductive freedom, not for the founders of this cult, but for the first generation of the That society is not going to let those individuals have the reproductive freedom to move in and out of the group, then I think that that would be ethically wrong. So, I, I and that would likely dissolve the cult pretty fast. <laughs> no, genetically, it's a nightmare to put everybody in the same bottleneck there, uh, unless you can keep doing it from generation to generation and have the right enhancements. So I would argue that they probably don't think reproductive freedom is uh, obviously not a right, right, in the same way that the society they're in does. Or, I think it does go to this question of society versus privacy. So, to, to that end, let's look at uh, Let's look at the bee chip. I like this one. <coughs> so the baby chip, the single DNA chip is developed, and this is not far off, folks. Uh, in your doctor's office that can test prospective parents for all serious genetic disorders, as well as a broad range of genetic susceptibilities for illnesses as diverse as bipolar disorder, diabetes, obesity, the chances of developing it, and relative resistance to common infectious diseases. A government study suggests that the true medical and social impact of this isn't going to be realized unless the test is mandated and unless parents, prospective parents act on the results. In other words, avoid uh, uh, carrying to term infected fetuses. So a patient advocacy group would argue, perhaps, that this is a matter of personal choice. We have to respect reproductive freedom. The AMA states that, in line with its Hippocratic principle to do no harm, this is a public health matter. People should not be free to inflect, to infect, inflect. Is that the right word? Inflict. 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 Thank you. Inflict. Inflict. I'm a bad typer. Avoidable diseases on their children, especially if we are ever to have affordable health care in this country. And Congress decides to send it to the states, punt, <laughs> most of which decide to punt it to the voters. This is a really kind of messy thing, and this is not a far off scenario. We already see some of this happening now. So let's let's start with this notion of, well, first of all, what do you think? I mean, is, is this something that should be mandated, not mandated? Isn't this the 21st century version of testing for syphilis to get a marriage license? It, it is. So it's, it's so we're like already it. doing, we're already doing, well actually maybe getting, getting rid of that, but we're already doing it in a simple sense. Sure, yeah, this is, these things are, are, the regulatory framework is set up in such a way based on things like testing for syphilis or HIV that it's fairly easy to add a few other diseases here. And the technology will become good enough to be used in the office. So. I just think it's particularly scary because there, there are so many genes I have multiple effects. Like the first thing that comes to my mind is like sickle cell anemia, right? Like in a homozygous recessive state, right? It's very, very harmful. But in certain environments in the heterozygous state, it actually is not so harmful and can actually be beneficial. So we just don't know enough about every single gene, you know, in every single like diabetes. I mean, who knows? I mean, that's that's a gene that affects, you know, the metabolic pathway and all these different aspects and eliminating one aspect of it can really be quite harmful in the future. Sure. Let's let's say it, 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 in terms of the science, we've gotten to the point where we know that if you have this combination, with use diabetes, for example, you're going to develop type 2 diabetes by the time you turn 30. And it's going to be a particularly horrendous course of it. It's going to be really refractory as treatments. So if we just start to dissect diabetes into that many 30 different diseases that, that it is, so you'll have some that are more severe and some that are lesser severe. So the question then becomes, where do you put that line? as to what level of diabetes is acceptable and what's not. So I mean, we'll pretend the science is there. But I really was hoping, that, what I'd like to get at is, is this a test kind of thing that really should be mandated for the sake of the human population, for the sake of society, or is this a purely private matter? Pre-abortion. So Congress wants to mandate it, and they'd like to mandate that you have to act on it. But it's, the market's going to drive how, how people react. Yes, sir. Yeah, I probably should be too. 
it seems to me that this is the obverse of the first one. In the first case, you had the few versus the many, and in this case, you have the many versus the few. In one case, you had a small group of people, a conclave of people who had a certain wish that conflicted with that of the larger group in which they were theoretically a part. And in this one, it's simply the obverse, where the greater number have a different point of view that they want to enforce on the fewer. So the resolution of these conflicts hinges on how you resolve conflicts between the many and the few. Okay. So uh, that's exactly uh, the point. It's, it's, a, it's good. You should be doing this for a living. <laughs> oh, you probably do. I, um, so this, this notion of, of, of private, this private versus public, pri private rights, societal need, uh, individual good, uh, public good. Is, is at the heart of so much of this research, especially, especially where it's tied to disease. The second aspect of this that's really critical to think about is how do you, and we, as we raise, is how do you define disease all of a sudden? What, what is really disease and what is inconvenience or you know, a, lesser, uh, uh, a lesser desired genetic makeup? Um, this, this opens up the door to all kinds of practices, that, uh, both good and bad. Um, I don't think, know if we're going to resolve this, but this is something we have to think about. Is human being, does a human being live as a part of society, or is the human being an intent, intentional, uh, intently private individual? Mandated something that you would not seek to avoid. Right. And, and, and there would be access issues as well. So you'd have to be <coughs> like basically practicing eugenics in another nation. Exactly, and is that an individual choice, or is that going to be something, you know, sci the scientists are not good at making these choices, but uh, is it, I, don't, I, yeah, I, I don't know if Congress is either, <laughs> so. I, yeah, go ahead, we'll switch on. But in the next, I don't think we're supposed to have this specific insight into it, and I think that's where the problem is. Like, you can have this So let, let's explore that a little more. Uh, can you? I'm going to give you the microphone. So we can hear this. We've got a microphone. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like Phil Donahue, but <laughs> I'm not married to Marlo Thomas. So. <laughs> can you say that again? Um, that our world has a specific caring capacity and that things are in balance. And I think by having some of this insight into our genetic uh, makeup, I think uh, upsets that balance. So, so where, where do you, uh, I, I'm not picking on you, I want no. to kind of draw this out. Where do you get the uh, uh, belief or, or information that there's this, you say caring capacity? Yeah, or? I mean our planet has a caring capacity and there's only so many humans that can live and nature plays out that mutations are taken out of the gene pool and stuff and if we're going in and fixing these mutations you know, there comes this play of what's natural and where's the balance when what? Oh, carrying capacity. Yeah, so um, we don't, from a scientific point of view, the, the, the human species is, hasn't been around very long. Um, we've been very successful thanks to whatever mistake evolution made in letting us have brains. Um, at exploring niches and actually changing niches. So. In a sense, we have disrupted the apple cart of how evolution's worked before. But with the question of whether we've already gotten to the point where we're destroying it, I mean, we can have arguments about all that for a while. But from a science point of view, it just means we're a very successful organism. Um, for evolution doesn't really make judgments that way. It's, it's our reflection on it that it happens. But if, what that says, though, is that you have a fundamental uh, belief about the sustainability of life. And I, what I was trying to get at is where do you derive that from? 
Um, this, this is this, I mean, I'm not trying not to pick on you. We all have these kind of ideas and stuff floating in our heads, and I'm trying to challenge folks to say, where did that idea come from? Don't uh, say yeah, Al Gore. It's just a <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's a tough question. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. what you're saying I would wonder is that any different than the fact that we actually were able to build houses to protect us from the elements ultimately you know they, we've ended up saving a lot of human life that wouldn't have been reproducing if uh, the, the the natural world had had its way just simply because we've protected ourselves is that a different dynamic by adding genes to the mix I would not agree with. Um, you put people in a position where they, you might almost say, are playing God for their God for their life. So I think anyone who's had a, a loss, a serious illness, a job, will not say, "I would do it over again. I would feel bad for it to come on me." And yet, there's so many things that we learn as human beings going through the trial. So there's the idea that we're going to back of the world and, and remove all uncertainty and bad outcomes. I think it's, it's wrong from our, my understanding of, of what it means to do. You have to be able to accept that these bad uncertainty is only the problem. I, I understand entirely what you're saying, and it goes down to this notion of what your beliefs are of human nature, and uh, what, what does it mean to be a human being. and. Uh, there are, you know, as, as eloquently as you put it, there are also people that disagree with you, and just as eloquently. So that's why I'm trying to get to this notion of well, how do we reach rapprochement, or don't we, and let the market run with this whole thing. Let me, let me do, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Well, you guys are going to have a lot of homework, okay? <laughs> yeah. So getting back to this case, too, the B-chip. Um, so I think, so one is able to exercise one's reproductive freedom if it doesn't infringe on the rights of others, right? You're able to exercise your personal freedom. You can do whatever you want as long as you don't infringe on the rights of others. That's, that's a very constitutional. So in this case, um, you know, if by not doing this, you could inflict public harm, that means it will infringe on the rights of others. For example, you know, what if you don't test these these uh, babies, and uh, eventually, who's going to have to pay for the who's going to pay for the cost of caring for these uh, illnesses later on, right? Possibly um, our tax dollars. So tax dollars that's infringing on my right on how I want to spend my my money. And so by by that logic, I think you know these the patient advocacy group you know should should not be advocating what they're advocating because Thank you. Well, i was just going to say along that same logic you know if someone's poor and they get pregnant should along that same line you say well you need to get an abortion because you can't support the child and now the government's going to have to come and support the child so just kind of and but so just kind of I mean, it's genetics on one hand, or it's wealth on another hand. You know, there's this whole spectrum of things, I guess you could say. You know, of how much involvement people are going to 
how much playing God, I guess. I mean, I was just thinking before, you know, I have glasses. And without them, I can't see. And as I was joking with my friend, I'd probably be eaten by lions. So are we playing God by giving everyone who can't see well glasses? You know, I mean, should you know, we not have glasses so that we can, you know, slow, that we're introducing bad traits into society by doing things like this? So that, that's actually... That brings us to case three very well here. Let, let's do case three. No, seriously, it's a, it, it's a direct line in this. So Dick and Jane have both applied for the same management job um, in a large firm. In her resume, including her dossier, uh, Catherine has, uh, or Dick and Jane, I went to Catherine. How the? <laughs> no. Genetic enhancement. Uh, has a genetic enhancement certificate from Megagene. How did I change Dick and Jane to Catherine and Bill? <laughs> this, was, this was being done on the fly late last night, folks. Uh, that certifies she has benefited from genetic enhancement technology that gives her fewer colds and respiratory infections, greater memory and concentration skills. This is not outside the pale, folks, believe me, um, and low susceptibility to depression. Bill, who could not afford Megagene's prices growing up in a large Catholic family, <laughs> are, are, argues that making decisions on the basis of genetic enhancement is just as unfair as hiring based on race and gender. Catherine responds that her genetic makeup is entirely relevant to what they're trying to do, which is hire the best candidate. Who are you going to hire? <laughs> Apart from, like, uh, you know, gender quotas, who would you hire? <laughs> it's very similar. I mean, someone has glasses. You got, if you're working in a, uh, um, a chip making fact, a DNA chip making factory, and one of you can't see at all and doesn't have glasses, and the other has glasses, you know, who do you hire to do that? You have a job that requires someone who's there a lot, can't afford, that travels a lot, doesn't want to get airplane flus all the time, that actually has a, a requirement to be up and excited and happy. She does marketing or PR or something like that. You know, who do you hire? And is it a merit-based thing? And it, this genetic enhancement stuff, I mean, they're testing AMPA receptor uh, drugs, right? AMPAs are things involved with memory. In Germany, in trials, it's having amazing results with these compounds where people's memories are increased dramatically. It's not beyond the pale to think you can actually go in and just tweak the AMPA receptor itself. So this is, this is a tough question. So who, who, who would you hire? Yeah. That is really, how much do your genes define you, right? And what, what you know, there's still the whole environmental factors. What about bills of comedy? You know, like, what, how, much do those, how much do your genes define and predict those particular qualities? And can you really make predictions from that? And that and so that, that makes me say, you know, I would just hire them. I wouldn't consider genes at all. Yeah. So that raises an interesting point, um, and, and one that we should have made earlier. So genes are not destiny. You know, genet the, genetic reductionism doesn't work in science or in ethics. Um, all, all genes do is basically carry information that's expressed in proteins that interacts pretty heavily with your environment. You look at identical twins, they're not identical. They're identical genetically, phenotypically they're not identical. So it's a bit of a crapshoot. Now things like this though, where you can actually go in and know the mechanism well enough, I mean we know the mechanism of Gleevec well enough to stop cancer, there's no reason we can't go in with another compound knowing the mechanism of memory and alter memory. I mean so it's a distinct possibility. Um, but again, our, our genes are not entirely our destiny, but they're certainly part of it. Things like, like intelligence are, are not as, you know, there's so many other factors that come into play. And it's a combination well, it, of memory and motivation and all these different things. And can you really control that much just by tweaking a gene? That's right. So, I mean, the whole developmental process, how the brain is laid down. But if you have the kind of right genetic stickies early on to make a little tighter synapse here or that, theoretically, that could lead to a better ability at memory. So it's, it's not outside the pale. I mean, the, the chemicals all work. It's just a question of how they work in the environments they find themselves in. So there's a lot of stuff that's, that's wide open. So there's very few things that are actually purely genetically determined, as we know from even one gene, one disease states, but genetics is always a part of it. It's, it just depends on how the environment drives it. Sorry. Oh, just one more. I realize we're running, running out of time. You guys have homework to do, but. <laughs> um, uh, people are more than what their genes say they are. So that um, even though your genes may say you're going to die at a certain time, it doesn't really mean that you will. It's just 
you're genetically labeled for it, but it doesn't mean you have to follow along that line. So we can, we can alter genes. I mean, the, the phenylketonuria uh, ketonuria, uh, is a great example. You have a, a defect in that, uh, in that enzyme, in the gene that encodes that enzyme, and you eat phenylalanine, you're going to be seriously ill or die. But you can avoid it. You know, you don't eat the stuff. So we, that's a, like a real simple example of how genes are not necessarily destiny. You can arrange environmental things. Now that said, you're still carrying that gene. And if you, someone sneaks you a, a, a phenylalanine a, a Mickey, that's not a, a, not a happy thing um, because we know chemically what's going to happen. I would argue that even uh, we think about things beyond diseases, we start thinking about behavioral traits and, and stuff like that. There's always going to be some genetic component that contributes to it. And it's inextricable from, nature, from uh, nurture. So if you talk, talk about genes being nature and nurture being the environment, it's, in, it's impossible to tease out the two things. They're both absolutely required. You can't dismiss one or the other, ultimately. Um, it may be that someday we actually can discover what it is that gives people religious feelings or what, what it is that gives people, uh, makes some people more uh, maternal and others less maternal. I mean, these are all things that are kind of being looked at. There's a fascinating thing in, the, uh, in nature this week. There was an article in the Times today about these, these people hiding in Siberia, Siberia, these scientists who bred rats for a few generations, make some really vicious and some really uh, calm. And they're looking at what are the genetic things that contributed to that, in addition to the environment trying to make them vicious or calm. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating area. And all, all that science can help us inform help inform these kind of cases so we understand the science, but it's not going to help us ultimately decide them. So, but so that's your homework. You have to go home and figure out the answers to all these things <laughs> and send them to me. Okay, folks. Well, thanks very much. I want you to come back next week. David Altshuler is going to talk about genetic variants and how we actually look at gene linkages and get you back to the science again. Okay?